Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special symposium on sustainability in conjunction with 2022 Annual International Business Ethics and Sustainability Case Competition. My name is Yong Sun Pat. I'm a professor of international business and management at the College of Business Administration of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. I'm also director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CY or Cyber, using the acronym. Today's program is hosted by LMU Net Impact Graduate Chapter and co-sponsored by LMU Center for International Business Education, Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability. You will hear more about IBES and Net Impact later from Professor Jeff Thies and students' leadership. Let me just briefly introduce LMU side. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the country that has received the prestigious cyber grants from the US Department of Education in 2018. The LMU side serves as a regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LMU Cyb has been offering conferences and webinars on various topics on international business, such as global supply chain, global trade, innovative global marketing, and global talent management. Three years ago, LMU Cyb organized its first Global Sustainability Summit to discuss the progress of the UN's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how business and academia can work together to be innovative leaders in the field of sustainability. Today, we are very glad to sponsor another important conference on sustainability with a special focus on companies' innovation to effectively control the growing impact of climate change through decarbonization. I'm excited to hear about success stories showcasing leading innovations in different parts of the world. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dale Smith, Dean of College of Business Administration, and ask her to say a few words to welcome the audience. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck, and good afternoon, evening, or morning to all of you joining today. As Dr. Peck indicated, I'm Dale Smith, the Dean for our College of Business Administration, and also a huge fan of our graduate chapter of Net Impact, and IBES as well, and CYBE, so the list goes on. But one of my greatest points of pride for this school is our commitment to sustainability in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And when I first learned that our graduate students wanted to start a Net Impact chapter here in CBA, I was truly over the moon. For the startup of our Net Impact chapter, captures our passion for making a difference, where business has a voice at the table, addressing some of the most significant challenges of our time. And we share those values that business really can do well by doing good. You know, as Dean, I'm often asked to make some opening welcoming remarks. And, and last night I was at the Wall of Honor for our entrepreneurship program. And I talked then about an experience that really captured the importance of making a difference through business, in particular around sustainable innovation globally. And I'd like to just quickly share something that captured that innovation spirit of CBA, that global perspective, as well as sharing what we value as a college and how we prepare future leaders. So just a few weeks ago, I returned from travel with our executive MBA students. We were in Israel doing a, a deep dive into Startup Nation and an ecosystem that has distinguished itself as a place where entrepreneurs are creating the future around sustainable practices, in this case related to water. The students, faculty, and I were learning about a very unique ecosystem. We talked desalination, water purification, and innovation, topics so relevant for California and certainly other parts of the world. We were learning from startups that were addressing water challenges using satellite technology, creative and resource-saving technology for drip irrigation around water to make advances in agriculture, and even how to address water scarcity quite literally by pulling potable drinking water out of the air. I mean, it's a thing. And the leaders and entrepreneurs we met were taking green and blue tech to the next level. They were considering humanitarian ways to bring water to field hospitals and, and neighboring nations. And they're consciously thinking about water innovation as a tool for peace while still making money from a triple bottom line perspective. Now, while our group that was traveling left 
the birthplace of three major world religions with new insights. What struck me and inspired me was being surrounded by business leaders who in the most difficult of circumstances were creating the kind of future to bring about needed change in a country beset by political strife, conflicts that require new and creative ways to bring about peace, and doing so much in the way um, LMU's president, Tim Snyder, talks about creating the world we want to live in. Now, our panelists tonight will be focused on that kind of future, only from a perspective of another issue so important in the SDGs, from that perspective of decarbonization. So to address these topics and really bring about, bring about change, to live a mission-oriented, a purposeful life, is very much what I know our graduate net impact chapter is all about and what our guest panelists will speak about this evening. But what's important to me is it's the way that all of us think about the world in terms of developing that mindset, a skill set, an experience that provides the greatest hope in addressing the adversity facing our planet, bringing about change and innovating to make our global community a better place. And sure, I saw that with the students in Israel and I know it happens around the globe. But I'm really proud to say that I'm honored to see that cultural perspective every day when I see what our faculty are doing, our staff, our students, and our alumni creating their future. And in the words of our CBA mission, our college mission, advancing knowledge and developing business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in that global community. So thank you all for being here tonight. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce to you next the director of our Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability. This is a colleague who I work with on the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, known as the GRLI, an organization that shares the values I've been chatting about, and also working together with our colleagues around the world to make progress on the SDGs. With a special shout out before I introduce you, Professor Jeff Dees, to the students who are wrestling with these issues in the case competition that starts tomorrow morning. So anyway, back to you and introducing Professor Jeff Dees. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dean Smith, and uh, for those kind words and recognition of the shared work that we all do to advance uh, sustainable development in business education. Uh, the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability is a center of excellence that was founded really to focus on and strengthen research and business collaboration and highlight leading practices that are engaging the moral imperatives of sustainable development. Uh, as Dean Smith said, and as Professor Peck said, uh, there is a focus on the sustainable development goals, the global relevance and impact of those sustainable development goals, and the business practices, both domestic and global, that advance the sustainable development goals. Uh, IBES, in a short plug here, you can Google LMU IBES and learn all of the details, uh, really works in many different ways, and tonight's program is one example of that. Uh, a reference has been made to the International Business Ethics and Sustainability Case Competition, and welcome those who are participating in that competition to tonight's symposium. Uh, we are honored to have 26 teams, both domestic and global, graduate teams and undergraduate teams, who are each selecting business cases that represent a business ethics issue that uh, relates to one of the sustainable development goals. And then they will do a presentation in front of uh, panels of executives to explain their solution to that problem and showing how their solution makes sense legally, financially, and ethically. This is just one example of the kinds of things that we do to anchor uh, our practices and our activities in business, business relevance, and also highlight, again, the importance of both environmental and social responsibility as foundational uh, to business leadership and to business practice. One of the things that IBES does is to support and work with our graduate net impact chapter. This is an organization student run and student directed uh, that identifies uh, and builds programs and practices supporting sustainable development. And we are really honored to have tonight's event hosted, facilitated, and really enabled through the work of the net impact chapter and their leadership, Amara Ley and Ernesto Solis. And now it's my honor to introduce them and to pass the baton to them. Thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you, Professor Diaz, for that uh, introduction here. And it's my honor to uh, introduce David Ross first. Uh, David is an ESG and climate leader, bringing over 10 years of global infrastructure development and climate uh, advisory experience. Uh, he has worked across industries to support corporations, governments, and nonprofits and mitigate their climate challenges in cost effective and value driven manner. David is currently a leader in KPMG's ESG and climate advisory team, where he helps clients transform their organizations by embedding ESG and climate considerations into their operation. Uh, lastly, David leads the team's efforts on decarbonization, renewable energy, and electrification, supporting organizations as they plan for and transition to a low carbon future. And with that, it is my honor to introduce our guest speaker, David Ross. Great, thanks Ernesto. Hello everyone, good to be with you here this evening. Um, I thought I would just start and provide a little bit more color of um, how I got to the role where I am and then kind of walk through the, the topic of that we have at hand today. But maybe just a, a question to Ernesto and Mara, were you all gonna pull up the slides or do you want me to share screen? Yeah, I can share my screen if that's easier for you. Sure, that's fine. Cool. Um, so I started my career in the government. Um, I actually worked for an agency that invested at the early stage of infrastructure projects abroad with the goal of assessing project feasibility, um, thinking about return on investment and helping to mitigate kind of that early stage risk. And I worked on projects globally um, in Latin America, the Middle East, Asia, but the majority of the work that I did was in the energy sector. Um, so over time, that kind of grew to supporting this global energy transition. And while we didn't formally call it ESG at the time or follow a, a formal framework, we generally evaluated our projects and investments with a lot of the same criteria that we now see in GRI, SASB, such as energy use, waste, labor practices, um, human capacity development, in addition to just those financial metrics. So I then transitioned to KPMG's infrastructure advisory team and was brought in to help grow that energy side of our consulting and advisory business. So we started with this uh, focus on the nexus of energy and transportation. Uh, our group kind of had a, a lot of client base in the transportation sector. So we were doing work with zero emission buses, solar projects, electric trains. But what we quickly realized was there is a much larger opportunity to support organizations on their energy transition, their decarbonization, strategy and generally their, their climate journey, um, but doing it in a way that actually creates value for the organization and it's not just a check the box compliance activity. So this was about the same time that KPMG as a company was investing much more heavily in ESG. So we had the opportunity to formally stand up our ESG and climate team. So as Ernesto mentioned, I uh, lead our decarbonization work and then kind of dabble in our broader ESG strategy and climate risk work. Um, our client base is uh, kind of a mix of private equity, financial services, um, and then corporates, both publicly traded and privates. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Mara? Um, very quickly, KPMG is a, a large advisory company. I think we have 30,000 people in the U.S., um, a much smaller subset that focuses on ESG and climate, um, but we kind of cover all industries, um, and um, I'll, I'll just leave it there for, for now. Um, but if we reflect on what the topic of today's session is, it's this idea of the business case to decarbonize. So if we go to the next slide, Mara, um, you know, you need a business case. We, we can we can hold it that that previous one. Yep. Uh, you need the, this idea of a business case for everything that you do in life. You know, to get into LMU, 
you had to put together a business case as to why you should be accepted. You know, this took the form of essays, tests, interviews. Um, when a company wants to grow a new business unit, they have to put together a business case to get buy-in from their executive team, the board. Um, you know, that takes the form of financial analysis to show metrics on ROI, payback periods, return on equity, whatever it might be. Um, so naturally, you know, it should make sense that we as individuals or companies or society at, at large, um, we need to put together a business case to decarbonize the economy that, that we have. So there's a lot of people that are passionate about combating climate change. I'm certainly one of them. I'm sure everyone on, on, on this uh, in this session is as well. But one of the best ways to truly make a difference is to have a rationale that's backed by data of not only how to change, but the direct and indirect impacts of what that change are. So let, just to make this kind of tangible with a, a very simplistic example. So I live in Redondo Beach. I'm about 10 miles south of, of where you all are on, on the bluff. Um, I buy my electricity from the local utility, which comes from a mix of energy sources, mostly natural gas and some renewables. Now, if I want to reduce my personal carbon footprint uh, from energy from electricity consumptions, there's really two main options that I have. One is I can pay a premium for every uh, kilowatt hour of power that I consume um, and just get that clean energy from my utility. Or two, I can install solar panels on the roof. Um, I'm not. I won't get into carbon credits. I'll let David P talk about that next, but. So how do I make my decision? I have two options. I basically need to come up with a business case of what to do. You know, I think about the pros and cons of each. If I go down the utility route, you know, it's easy to do. There's no upfront capital costs, um, but it doesn't help me mitigate against the resilience needs we have in California, blackouts, price escalations. Um, you know, if I think about solar panels, the cons, you know, expensive CapEx, um, longer payback period, but it's free power once it's paid off, it's more resilient. So that's a very simplistic example of, you know, how, how I think about a business case to decarbonize, but it's not really any different from what governments or corporations are thinking about. So if we, if we go to the next slide, the, the driving factors that I and kind of we as our KPMG team think about that's really driving organizations to decarbonize falls into these four buckets. Um, one is government mandates and goals. So this is everything from your the like the SEC regulations uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago on their proposed climate disclosures to um, state level policies, um, even countries that implement um, carbon taxes. You have stakeholder pressures and reputational pressure. So what are what is a company's customers demanding? What are their investors demanding? Um, if you think about it from a financial position, there's data, there's growing data that's starting to show if you have a decarbonized business, if you're addressing climate risk head on, you'll get favorable terms for capital, lower cost of capital. Um, and then if we actually move over to the cost of operations, you can get more security in your price of electricity um, and just you know, generally more efficiently run business if you can identify and mitigate the risks associated with, with climate change. Uh, next slide. So when we think about all the challenges and uncertainties that are out there, with climate change, with decarbonization, we've kind of bucketed these into five different elements and it's kind of a, a journey that we often take organizations through, but it, I think it's helpful to work to help um, kind of capture all of the questions that, that people ask, right? So some of the questions you see here, I'm sure are things that are being taught in the classrooms, but these are the same types of questions that large corporations, startup companies, are trying to figure out themselves, right? They're trying to figure out, you know, just from the very baseline, 
how do I start my decarbonization journey? Where, what is my ambition? Where do I want to be? Um, you know, start, they'll start thinking about, do I need to engage my supply chain? How do I think about scope three emissions? Where do I want to be in the future? Um, do I start setting targets? And then as you get into this, the middle section, the scenario planning, you know, now that I kind of have an understanding of where I am, where I want to go, how do I get there? You know, do I invest in one thing? What's what's the trade-off? What's the impact? Are there opportunities for cost savings? Um, and then defining this all into a roadmap and actually op operationalizing it is kind of that that final step where you, you you know you can get into the implementation of projects, the transactions that actually help to decarbonize a business. Next slide. So kind of bringing this back to the, the business case idea, there's four different areas that we kind of think about. Um, the first is starting with a clear understanding of what's important to your stakeholders, and that's the stakeholders of, of the business. Um, trying to define what the measures of success are, what's actually within reach for stakeholders, what you know, financial ROI, what brand reputation, what risk management elements need to be thought about. Um, you need to just define where you're starting from. If you don't define where you start, you can't define where you're trying to go to, um, and you can't build upon any of that early success that you may have. And then finally, it's actually defining what that opportunity is. Um, you know, there's a saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, but the best plan needs to understand that you know the current landscape priorities and balance what you accomplish today versus what you're actually trying to get to tomorrow um, so if we go to the next slide I, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about these decarbonization levers and there's there's this slide and there's a the subsequent slide that lays out a few more and i, I don't want to talk about all of them as i'm sure most folks are familiar but i just want to highlight a few of these levers that we call them that a company can can pull on can activate to actually make an impact on their business and there's a few that we've seen to be the most impactful and drive the biggest impact for a dollar spend um, the first is energy efficiency you know it, it's it's great to transition to new energy sources but if you can actually reduce your energy consumption you can save money and you can save emissions so there's Tons of different ways to do that, but energy efficiency generally is a great starting point. Um, the next one is PPAs here. So purchasing renewable energy through a power purchase agreement or some other form, you know, scope to emissions oftentimes are, are the, the, the lion's share of a company's direct emissions, assuming they're kind of a, a standard, standard corporate in, in office space. Um, so figuring out how to secure green power, um, whether it's through a virtual power purchase agreement, a direct BPA, or working with your utility, that's a, a great way to drive down corporate emissions. Offsets is another big area, but I will leave that to, to David P to talk about, who will be much more knowledgeable and interesting than, than myself on that one. Um, if we go to the next slide, the the topic of supply chain management so this gets into your scope three emissions typically an organization's supply chain is where the vast majority of the overall emissions are so if you can find a way to successfully engage with a supply chain that is going to pay dividends to having a successful um, a sexual so story to tell around your climate journey. And then the last one to touch on is this green financing. So, um, you know, in, in a perfect world, companies could reduce their carbon footprint for a lower, for, for, um, for cheaper than whatever the normal course of business would be. It's possible to do that in certain situations, but it's not always possible. So having different financial instruments having green bonds, um, you know, ETFs that are focused on uh, investing in green companies, whatever it might be, 
you know, credit revolving credit solutions that are specifically targeted to um, green to green technologies. This is I see as one of the, the largest areas of growth going into the future that is going to have to um, have to take you know the front seat if we're going to be successful in decarbonizing the economy. Uh, next slide. So the, the last thing that I'll, I'll kind of touch on is how we as KPMG kind of take all of that and put it together. Um, you know, at, I'm a consultant. I, I typically kind of think about how to um, how to come to a decision with leveraging ideas about cost, efficiencies, and packaging that into, into a business case. Um, so one of the things that we do is uh, scenario planning and modeling with clients to help them think through the way to set their decarbonization targets and then actually achieve them. So we do a lot of this modeling of what the impacts of various decarb levers would be, whether it's PPAs, offsets, energy efficiency, but we want to be practical. So we focus on where the emissions actually come from. So the assets themselves, um, the assets that emit greenhouse gases. So if it's a company with a big fleet, we look at the vehicles. If it's a company with a big office footprint, we look at the energy they're buying from the grid and the air conditioning units and lights and, and all of that. Um, and then we try to develop a solution from the bottom up to help an organization reduce its emissions. So if we look at this, this chart that's here, um, this is kind of the, this nice story that we like to tell where if you think about a company's uh, trajectory for a science-based target that they may have, may have set for 2032, that's the shaded blue lines in the background. Um, and then against that, what we do is map different decarbonization scenarios, what their impact on GHG reduction would be and what the resulting cost would be. So these are just theoretical numbers to, to kind of help paint the, paint the picture. But if we think about a company who has a net present cost over the next 12 to 15 years of $470 million, assuming business as usual, let's say they implement solar on some of their facilities. Um, it's probably going, you know, it might save them a little bit of money, but it may not move the needle that much because they don't have that that much rooftop space or square footage to actually put solar. You know, what if they can if it can electrify some of their assets? Uh, maybe it can move the needle a little bit more, but it's going to cost them more money to do that. But what if we look at that bottom yellow line? What if we look at buying renewable energy and also electrifying our assets? You know, is it possible to actually get to close to net zero just from those two items? Um, while also saving money and then maybe layering offsets on top of that to get to the true net zero. This is the story that we try and tell to a lot of clients, often from the bottom up, look, looking at the actual assets that drive emissions. Um, I think I'm getting close to my allotted time. I, I can maybe talk to some of the uh, client examples we have during the Q&A, but um, which that we have on the next slide, but maybe I'll, I'll leave it there for, uh, for the rest of the team to go through. Perfect. Thank you, David. Um, I think from here, I'm going to head and uh, hand this over tomorrow and then we'll take Q&A at the end. Okay. Great. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Mara here or Mark, do you want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker? Yeah, thank you so much, David and Ernesto. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to David Bocher. We're going to go by David B, or DB is what I'm going to call him because we have two Davids here. Uh, but DB leads business development and partnerships for Pachama, which is a verified marketplace for forest carbon offsets. It is backed by Bill Gates' Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and Pachama is harnessing the latest technologies in remote sensing and AI to enhance verification and monitoring of carbon capture by forests and natural ecosystems. 
Their mission is to unlock private sector funding for critical work of protecting, enhancing, and expanding natural carbon sinks and restoring humanity's balance with nature. And at Pachama, David's role is really focused on the demand side of the business, generating interest and in signing on partners such as Shopify, Microsoft, BCG, and Flexport, and um, most recently, Viore, which I'm the sustainability manager there, so really excited to be working closely with David. Um, but in other news, I'll pass it over to you, David. And very, very soon, KPMG. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, yeah, I think just to kind of segue off of David R's presentation, um, there's so many elements when it comes to just all things carbon. Um, one thing I want to highlight, um, both of these statements are true. There is no way in which we can achieve uh, our planet's 2030 climate goals of maintaining sub one and a half degree temperature increase by the year 2030. Um, there's no way we can offset our way to that number. To, to, we need all of the solutions that David Ross talked about for decarbonizing. We need to start significantly reducing emissions. That also being said, the technology does not exist today for carbon removal. There is no amount of trees that humans as a species can plant today that will get us there if our continued rates of deforestation are not stopped. Um, at our current rates, I think it's like a football per minute in the Amazon of deforestation. Um, climate scientists predict that we'll turn the Amazon from one of the biggest carbon sinks on this planet um, we will ruin the sub ecosystems that create its own rain and we might create another Sahara and you could turn one of the world's biggest carbon sinks into one of the world's biggest carbon emitters. So just to set the table right, when we're talking about carbon offsets, by no means are carbon offsets going to be a silver bullet. They are a solution um, and everything, they, they complement everything that you heard um, from David Ross in his part of the presentation. What I like to actually start um, pretty much every sales call I'm on with is, is the mission of Pachama, and our mission is to restore nature. How we are going about executing our vision is we are developing technology to improve the trust and the quality around nature-based solutions. Um, as of today, what we went to market with, it's an exclusive focus on forest-based carbon offset projects. And for us, really, our belief is if you were going to be offsetting, at least a significant part of your portfolio should be in nature-based solutions. Why? Because there are so many co-benefits that go beyond just the price of carbon. At the end of the day, a carbon offset is a financial instrument. It's a tool for a company to be able to measure, track, reduce on one side, and then be able to compare one forest project to another forest project to a methane landfill or a cook stove project. But if we're just looking at this through the lens of carbon, we're, we're kind of missing the bigger picture here. When we're talking about forests, we're talking about ecosystems, we're talking about um, unique flora and fauna. Um, many old growth uh, forests are connected underground by fungal systems that allow these trees to communicate and share resources of droughts, pest, fire. We're talking about indigenous communities, access to clean water, cooler temperatures, agroforestry. Um, the carbon is just the tool that's measured to how we can compensate the climate impact um, and get the important work of conservation, management, and reforestation done. So what does Pachama do? Um, what we went to market with, what our primary business model to date has been, has been um, taking certified projects from all around the world. So we've got projects in North America, South America, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, China. We have reforestation projects, improved forest management projects, and um, red plus avoided deforestation projects. These are all projects that are certified by one of four um, internationally recognized um, carbon regulatory bodies, VERA, Gold Standard, Climate Action Reserve, American Carbon Registry. Now, the current methodology for getting forest projects certified today, believe it or not, involves sending people into the forest to manually count and measure trees diameter at breast height. Now, when you're talking about, we have projects that are literally the size of the state of Delaware. They have to take field plots, extrapolate that over a larger area. Um, because it's so time and labor intensive, expensive, we're talking 
uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars every time just to go through the audit. Many of these projects only get audited every five to seven years. As you can imagine, it leaves a lot of gaps in the analysis. So what we are doing at Pachama today is we are using remote sensing. We're able to take satellite imagery and take a project that's say 40,000 hectares. We can zoom out and look at 2 million hectares and we can go all the way back to the 80s. And we can analyze and see how has this forest, um, how has this region evolved? How has this project evolved? Is this project additional? In other words, is it actually justified? Was this area actually at risk of deforestation? Um, is this a reforestation project where we've observed that there was an old growth forest, the landowner cut down for timber money, and now they're replanting a tree plantation to get carbon credits, in essence, double dipping. Um, we can look at how they calculated the carbon credits that they did receive. Every forest project will always get credit for the amount of carbon that is sequestered because this project exists over, say, 40 years versus how much uh, carbon the project would sequester if it were not to exist, in other words, the baseline. That net delta is what they get credited for. What are they using for the baseline? Are they using a regional illicit deforestation rate or commercial harvesting rate of 40% to increase that delta when we know it's closer to 20%? How do they draw the project boundaries? Did they do it in such a way we call it gerrymandering where they don't include heavily clear-cut areas, but they do include offshore islands, steep ravines, wetlands, areas that were not economically feasible to be logged anyways. And finally, we monitor these projects on a continuous basis to ensure ongoing compliance. So I know that was a lot of words. I'm gonna hit pause there to do a quick screenshot um, and show you a sample um, of three projects that we've reviewed. Now, all three of these projects are projects that have certified offsets. You can go to any broker today and you can purchase credits. You can put them towards your company's carbon neutral goal and claim that you're carbon neutral. Now, this first project I'm gonna show you is a sample of a good project. What you're looking at here is about a million acres in um, the Brazilian Amazon. The bright green represents more dense rainforest starting in the 80s. These darker areas you'll see down here are areas of deforestation. This project's gonna be a big triangle in here. And what you'll see is, first off, why this project's justified, this area's at risk of deforestation. And then you'll see how the deforestation continues outside the project, but how this project actually does a good job of maintaining the integrity of the area that it's protecting. And you'll see in 2019, when they had, let's just call it a non-environmentally friendly regime change, the deforestation got even worse. So this is a good project. What you're gonna see here in comparison, so this project will be a little bit smaller. It's gonna be a little island right in here. And similar to the last project, you will see a lot of deforestation in this region. These projects are actually uh, adjacent. The other project I showed you is just off the map. So this project is what we consider additional. It is justified. The issue with this project, which you'll start to see is they're getting paid, they're getting compensated to conserve this area. But what we've observed is that the deforestation is continuing at too high of a rate inside the project boundaries. And it's even worse if you look at this uh, updated into 2021. And the last project I'll show you is kind of the opposite effect. So what you'll see here, first of all, uh, it's kind of cool, you'll see the Amazon River expanding. This project's gonna be an island right in here, but what you'll notice, or I should say you won't notice, is that there's no deforestation here. Of course, that's a good thing, but in terms of what a, a certified carbon offset project should be, there's no additionality. In other words, if this project didn't exist, this area would still be protected. Now, if you were boots on the ground there 10 years ago, you know the Amazon in general is at risk, and then you went back today, you would think this project is doing a good job of protecting it, but we know using remote sensing, that project wasn't really justified to begin with. It, as I said, it wasn't at risk. To put this in a little bit of context, uh, at Pachama now we've reviewed over 150 projects um, over the last couple of years, and we've actually rejected a little over two thirds of them. So uh, that's a high level of what we went to market with. What most of our business has been today is working with 
companies such as KPMG, Shopify, Fiori, um, who want to offset, helping the buyer have more trust and transparency in selecting the projects that are actually having climate impact. What we are now, as we've raised our last round of funding, what we are growing our team to do is to also turn our attention into how can we use this remote sensing in our platform as a new tool to get new supply on the market. Um, put simply, there's not enough quantity of credits available on the market for all of the companies that you see now who are either carbon neutral or setting science-based targets and plan to be offsetting. Um, and we already know, you can just see in the samples I showed you that there's not enough quality of projects. So a big initiative for us is working with companies to invest up front and actually getting new projects off the ground and also using our technology as a new methodology for getting new projects um, measured, quantified, and um, verified so that we can start to get new projects and new supply uh, off the ground at scale. So uh, I think that's my 10 minutes. Uh, Mara, I'll kick it back to you. Oh, you're on mute. Yep. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much, David. That was really helpful for even just me to see. Like, I know that Pachama does great work, but like seeing those kind of projects and screenshots, that's super cool. Um, I guess one question right off the bat for you, David, is how long does it take you guys to verify a project? And how many like projects do you verify at the same time? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, that's a big part of what we're trying to do as a technology startup. Um, to put that in some context for you, um, we are now up to about 55 people. That is about 3x what we were April 2021. Um, it used to take us anywhere, depending on the, the project, the data, and how uh, complicated it was. Again, some of these projects are you saw are just an island. There's other projects. We have one uh, a reforestation project, TIST Uganda, that literally involves a thousand local um, landowners, small stake farmers, and it's like all these dots spread around the country. So projects like that can take up to three weeks. Um, so I would say a year ago, we were only able to analyze two projects a month, which was a big bottleneck for us, especially when we're rejecting two thirds of them. And that's what I, I can only sell what we approve. Um, Right now, I think we've gotten the technology down and, and a lot of it is the machine learning that's able to kind of analyze projects and parts of it on their own. Um, I think we are able to do a project in two or three days. Um, awesome. And of course, that's just evaluating a project up front. A big part of what we do is continuing to monitor the projects because just because they're good standing today doesn't mean that's that they're right. necessarily going to be in good standing six months from now three years from now. Totally. And then um, one other question, I guess, on that is I know Pachama's offsets um, are a little pricier than most on the market. Like you talked about like landfill methane offsets. Those are one thing. So you can also buy offsets that are renewable energy projects and those are tend to be a little cheaper. But I've also seen like a huge shift in the offset market pricing. Yeah. Um, so can you touch a little bit on like how your offsets compare in price, but in value, and then also like what's happening with the offset market in general, yeah. because that's like a whole nother beast. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, you know, I pivoted to career and sustainability um, exactly three years ago, so April 2019, when I left uh, the ad tech world. Um, and to put this in some perspective, we had projects when I first started. Um, our cheapest Red Plus projects were three to five dollars per ton. Um, our most expensive reforestation projects were like eight to nine dollars per ton. Um, now our cheapest, and this is really in the last nine months, our cheapest red plus uh, avoided deforestation projects are like 14 to 18. And we have reforestation projects um, that cost 30 to 45 dollars per ton. Um, what I kind of am telling a lot of people now in the market is that offsets are kind of like wine. Just because they're expensive, just because a bottle of wine is expensive doesn't mean that it's necessarily good. But if someone is offering you offset credits just based on what I've seen in the market, talking to other peers, other companies, um, going to conferences, is that if someone offers you a bottle of wine for under $10 a bottle, let's say, it's not possible. I live in Northern California, so I have a lot of friends in the industry. It's not possible using proper fermentation, 
um, methodology that you cannot create a bottle of wine for under 10 without adding sugar or oak flavor, oak flavoring, right? Taking shortcuts. So similarly, like for offsets, um, there's a lot of suspect quality out there. Um, just because it's expensive doesn't mean it's good. But if someone's offering offset credits right now for under $15 per ton, um, it kind of makes me raise my eyebrow. Um, I don't view my job as selling carbon offsets. I view my job as selling forest conservation or restoration. That's what gets me out of bed Monday morning. That's what gets me excited about the work I'm doing. And an offset is a tool, right, that can be used to do this work. Last thing I'll say is it's all relative compared to somebody's like methane or renewable energy credits, which are sus some, not all, some are, are quality, some are, um, you know, there's direct air capture technology that costs, I think I've heard of like, I've heard projects going for up to like eight or $900 per ton. So, and in, in compared to $800 per ton, a $15 per ton bed plus credit is, is pretty affordable. Hey, David, I, I've got a, a question just to jump in here. Um, sure. I, I, I'll, I'll let your, your comment about uh, you can't have good good wine for under $10 pass from my 21-year-old self a while ago. <laughs> but um, no, me, me too. <laughs> so if, if we... If we think about the science-based target initiative, that, yeah. that's one of the, the kind of larger initiatives that, that corporates often align to to show their, their progress. Um, we, we've kind of come to the opinion that they <coughs> just market a bit of a disservice with how they've positioned nature-based solutions in defining an organization's target and then you know how they reach net zero. Um, I'm curious how you all kind of talk about that because we, we've seen the kind of market going a little bit different way where you can, you can have nature-based solutions, carbon credits that accompany, you know, decarbonizing through the process. And there should be credit that you can take for that because as you said, actually removing carbon from the atmosphere through non-nature-based solutions is super expensive right now. It's just not, that technology is not quite there. So I'm just curious your perspective on how. <laughs> I don't think you realize how loaded of a question that was. Um, I teed it up for you, maybe. Yeah, uh, very like very strong opinions. Because and, and let me start by saying I'm a very big fan of SBTI. Like I think what they're doing and the amount of companies that have joined. As I started my like my you know my pitch, we need we can't offset our way out of this. We need to be decarbonizing significantly. And so I, of course, respect SBTI and what they're doing and putting the emphasis on decarbonization. That being said, I think as humans, we're so binary and we get so horse blinded and so focused, right? Cut tree down, plant tree. It's all even, right? Carbon, measure carbon, reduce carbon, offset carbon, it's even. I think that we're suffering from two crises right now. Carbon is one of them. Carbon's of course extremely important as a greenhouse gas, but we're also on the precipice of one of the largest mass extinction events of the last, I think it's like 20,000 years. Scientists predict at our current rate, we'll lose two thirds of our species if we hit, I think it's like three degrees of, of global temperature increase. I could be slightly off with these stats, but the point is, um, it it was very concerning to us that SBTI was like, you don't have, like, you have to set a baseline for I think it was like around 2020, and you have to reduce by it was like 80 to 90 percent. I'm not a full expert on the GHG accounting side um, by 2030, and then um, at that point you have to offset with only removals. What's the remainder? If you want to offset before then. We encourage it, but we don't require it. And it kind of drove me up a wall because there's no silver bullet when it comes to climate change. Um, this, is someone, this is someone else's line. There's silver buckshot. We need to be doing all at the same time, right? And I said that like our current rates of deforestation, and, and I know what, like President Trump is not necessarily the best, former President Trump, not necessarily the best example, but he literally in the same week he signed the Trillion Trees Initiative, he also signed for to allow logging roads in the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. That's the largest contiguous old growth forest left in the United States. That alone is responsible for 8% of our country's emissions. So like, wanted to pull my hair out. And it's no different in, you know, the Europe's way more progressive than us. 
same things going on, same things going on there with signing up for the Trillion Trees Initiative, but not stopping deforestation. So I, I, I guess to answer, like to, to summarize everything, like I'm a big fan of SBTI, but it is concerning that we're not, like, it's not, we're just so horse blinded on carbon as like the end all be all. And we need to see that this isn't just about carbon. It's also about preserving and restoring nature. So there's a uh, question in the chat. This one comes from uh, Gabriel uh, Rodriguez here. So it says, I know you mentioned, but can you repeat the best ways in which you can sell and explain the benefit of decarbonization to your clients? Sure. Um, so we typically think about it from the perspective of, um, if, if you think about that earlier slide I showed up of, there are four driving factors. You first have to think about what the driving factor is that your client might be wanting to act upon. Is it regulatory in nature? Is it um, responding to specific stakeholder requirements? Is it cost of capital? Is it cost of operations? So that's generally where we would start. And then you can kind of develop a solution that can respond to each of those. Um, some can be more aggressive, some can be cost related, some are just purely, we need to reduce emissions regardless of the cost. Um, but generally I, we would kind of start with identifying why they're decarbonizing, um, helping them understand where they are to start. So that, that current state, defining where they wanna to be to, um, to meet those stakeholder or um, regulatory requirements, um, and then do all that scenario planning and ultimately get to, okay, here's this roadmap of what we're gonna go down, here's the projects we're going to implement to actually achieve the solutions and satisfy whatever that initial challenge or, or, or stakeholder request was. Um, and this one is kind of, I feel like good for both Davids um, in a different way, but basically it's coming from Lawrence Calbers and they say there's currently controversy in California about incentives, again, like rebates for solar panels, et cetera. Among the arguments are benefits to those who least need it. How do we balance results with like who pays? Marginalized communities often have the least ability to pay and experience the most impact because of climate change, whether it's heat, pollution, rising ocean, et cetera. And I say this, it can go to both Davids just because I think there's also like parts of it with offsets too, like in the communities that you're helping and working in. And I know like Pachama does a lot of great work um, with communities overseas, like in Indonesia and whatnot. So I guess like, how are you thinking about it from all perspectives? Yeah, I, I can start David B. Um, so I, I can't speak specifically to solar panels and the incentives on those, um, but I can, I can give you an example where we're, we're thinking about this exact topic. So one of our clients is LA Metro, the transit agency for Los Angeles, and we're advising them on their transition to a zero emission bus fleet. So they've got 2,400 buses um, that they need to transition to either hydrogen fuel cell or battery electric by 2030. Um, it's a three and a half billion dollar project. And, um, you know, at this point, they've basically got eight years to do it. So it's a massive undertaking. One of the, as we define what the goals and objectives of the project are, one of those core objectives for LA Metro is social equity. So as we're thinking about the phasing of rolling out these zero emission buses, the routes that serve disadvantaged communities is one of the first things that, that we start thinking about. Um, you know, you, you raise a very good point where the, you know, you, if you think about like a port or an industrial complex, the real estate around those areas is often cheaper. Um, so, you know, lower income families are more likely to live there. And then they're more uh, exposed to the emissions, to the, the pollutants that are better, that are given off there. So embedding this idea of social equity and thinking about how to not forget those, those um, underserved communities 
embedding that into a project goal, a project criteria, I think is one of the best ways. So then as you're making decisions about how do I phase projects, where do I invest in things, that is one of the, the decision-making criteria along the way. Yeah, I am um, just to add my two cents. Um, I can't speak to solar panels in California, um, which is not my area of expertise. Um, what I can speak to is kind of more the, the generalized um, intent of the question. And um, right, when I talk about carbon offsets and, and supporting forest projects being more than just carbon, um, that's exactly what I'm referring to, right? It, it's in a way hypocritical for countries like the US to be like Brazil, Indonesia, Indonesia, a big part of their deforestation is palm oil expansion. We destroyed our Midwest for all of our, our corn and agricultural expansion here, amongst other things. Like, why, you know, why are we now to tell them, oh, now we know there's a climate emergency, so you can't keep developing as a country? That's a big part of the red plus avoided deforestation framework is how can we take money? In this case, or in my case, selling to big corporations from successful, wealthy, big companies and put those resources back towards incentivizing um, and creating an economic model that create that for indigenous communities um, around the world to keep their land, to maintain their land, to not cut it down, not turn it into more soy plant, uh, soy farms or agricultural feedlots. Um, you know, to, to kind of go back, one of the other things to also touch upon David R's thing about SBTI, um, when they signaled that they'll only consider removal credits, even though it's in 2030, that kind of signal to the market now, well, only removal credits are worthy. And it's not that I'm against removals or against tree planting, of course, I'm pro that, but I have to spend a lot of my time on calls now re-educating people on the importance of red plus avoided deforestation projects. And a big, big part of that is that so many of these red plus projects have these amazing social co-benefits. We have one project in the Peruvian Amazon, um, kind of tomorrow's question, like before about evaluating projects, this project engages with over 300 local community landowners. Um, they built a Brazil nut processing facility so that, um, and Brazil nuts, can't actually be grown as crops. They can only be grown in virgin rainforest um, so that they could actually process and sell and make an economic livelihood, not just sustenance farming and, and cutting down the rainforest for other means of income. They actually could make income off of the forest. So um, yes, when you're talking, at least, at least when I'm talking about forest carbon offset projects, many of them, and we strive to find projects that, of course, they have to pass our actual eval for the carbon benefit, but many of these projects do have um, impacts beyond, and, and that's a big, big part of the premise of Red Plus projects. Awesome. Um, so the next question, and I can also kind of jump in here too with my expertise, but it's from Lisa Loberg, and she says, as a reduction and potentially cost-saving strategy, are organizations considering eliminating the use of consumption of animal products, like switching to plant-based catering company, company-wide, for example, et cetera? So David Ross, I'm interested to hear, like, is this one of the reduction scenarios that you kind of show to clients, like, hey, you're eating a lot of meat, or maybe they are a leather company um, that produces a lot of leather, and that's where a majority of their emissions are coming from. Have you seen that from your perspective? Yeah, so it, it's a good point, and that really gets into the supply chain, right? So the different organizations we see are at different phases of their decarbonization journey. A lot of times, Companies that are new, uh, kind of newly thinking about ESG, typically start with just their scope one and two emissions, the direct emissions they have control over. Um, from there, they can start, they then start to think about what does my supply chain look like? So, you know, the plastic forks that I use in my cafeteria, the, the food products that I serve, um, the actual inputs to the goods that I manufacture, the you know, the Amazon trucks that deliver my packages uh, or UPS trucks, whatever, there's emissions across the whole supply chain. So um, 
the yes, th that's absolutely something that that we see. One of the the growing areas and most complicated areas, I think, is financed emissions. So it's that category fifteen of the GHG protocol scope three. Um, if you think about a bank that has credit facilities, they uh, invest equity, they have debt. All of those investments are into companies that have emissions. How do they start accounting for all of those emissions? Um, and then how do they start influencing through their investment criteria and all of that? So yes, I think you know, decarbonizing the supply chain is, is you know, one of the, the biggest areas that, that we can focus on to help decarbonize the economy more broadly. But it's also one of the most challenging, right? Because you as a company don't have direct control over what your suppliers do unless you write specific things into contracts. So it's kind of a, we kind of think about it as this combination of education of your supply chain. Um, if you're a larger organization with a lot of resources, like Walmart is a great example. Um, they have this project Gigaton where they're providing financing facilities for their supplier base to get renewable energy. Um, that financing facility is a great, a great thing to do, but there's, yeah, there's, there's a, a ton that, that companies can start thinking about to decarbonize the supply chain. Awesome. Um, we have a question here from Jeff Thies, um, and he says, where do you see the global dimensions of your work and your businesses? Thinking of global business education, ro what role do you see decarbonization has in both international business development and your businesses more generally? Um, so... I guess what, what I would say to that is, um, you know, not everyone in business is going to be an ESG or a climate expert. You have finance, you have accounting, um, you have operations folks, but each of those elements has to tie in to, to an organization having a successful decarbonization journey. So kind of whatever route that, you know, the, the, the students on this call or, or just international, you know, business students generally, they're thinking about where do I go in my career or, or how do I kind of want to take that step into the next business? You know, you can, you can tackle sustainability and climate change and ESG in a ton, ton of different parts of an organization. If you go into procurement, you know, you can help to write procurement specs that influence the supply chain. Um, if you go into accounting, you can think about the financial costs and also the carbon accounting elements for a business. So I, I would just kind of throw that out there that you don't have to just go into a sustainability role like some of us are in. You can go into other lines of business to help kind of grow that, that corporate culture with the view towards sustainability and, and decarbonization. Only thing, oh, no, you go, go ahead, David. The only thing I'll add, and this is more just from my perspective of just I talk with sustainability directors around the globe every single week and have just broader conversations, um, is that sustainability is also going to be long term good business. Whether it's regulations, uh, Corsia is going to start um, requiring airlines to be off to to be offsetting. Um, their flights, as an example. So it's an airline's interest to come up with sus more sustainable fuels that reduce their emissions. Um, one of the biggest things I've seen, and Larry Fink at BlackRock kind of started this a couple of years ago, is asset managers and investment funds investing and um, requiring companies to set science-based targets or other um, environmental benchmarks. Um, the SEC just came out with something last week. It's Tan, you know, is, is related to filings on uh, green claims and how you have to back it up. And so even though we don't necessarily have like direct government for most businesses interventions, um, money talks and investment talks. And so you're starting to see these influences. And the reality of it is and it's good business for companies to start decarbonizing now because we're 
at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, many of us here, I'm guessing, are all in California. Like, we're already starting to see the effects of climate change every summer with the fires here, right? It's not getting better anytime soon. So there's going to be a world where regulations really start to increase. So it's really in businesses. And, and, and the final thing I'll say is when I started two and a half years ago, when I was reaching out to Fortune 500 companies and whatnot, uh, I would say Fortune 500 companies, it felt like, and this is just anecdotal, I don't have stats this, to back this up, it felt like only 20% of Fortune 500 companies had somebody with sustainability in their title working for that company. When I look at companies and prospecting now, Fortune 500 companies, it feels like closer to 80% have a team or have at least a person who is a director of sustainability or higher at their companies. And that's been such a noticeable change over the last two years and kind of shows me that companies are starting to figure out, right, that they need to start taking this seriously. Well, I have a question for uh, you guys is, um, can you tell us about some success stories that you guys have had with decarbonization and organizations maybe you've worked with? Um, sure, yeah, if I, I can start there. Um, so, so what, one of the, I'll, one of the examples I'll talk to here is with a large um, uh, healthcare company with a national footprint of pharmacy retail um, stores. So they have about 8,500 retail stores across the country. Um, the company had set a science-based target to reduce their scope one, two, and three emissions by, uh, I think it was about 50% by 2030, and then trying to hit net zero by 2040. Um, the, the challenge for them was they set their targets in somewhat of, um, um, with kind of with blinders on. They didn't have a lot of data or evidence behind it of how they were actually going to achieve those targets. So we worked with them to um, kind of assess the various decarbonization levers that, that they could implement. Uh, they're a re retail store. So the majority of their emissions were from electricity consumption. And then they had a lot of refrigeration units. So it was um, fugitive, fugitive emissions from, uh, from those refrigeration units. So we kind of looked at this on a store-by-store approach of what are the different ways they could buy renewable energy. Some of these were retail stores in relatively rural areas where they could put solar panels on the roof. Some of these were in large office buildings where they had, you know, 50 stories above them. So they had to think about some type of virtual power purchase agreement. And some of them, they could just buy clean energy from the local utility. Uh, so we kind of looked at the, where each of the grids were going as kind of a, a forward looking trajectory, you know, the California grid versus, uh, the Northern Virginia grid versus, you know, parts of Michigan, of uh, what the different options were to buy clean energy or develop solar, um, and what the, the local regulations were for, for net metering and selling back to the grid. And then ultimately helped them understand what kind of this actionable path would be on a state by state, region by region, and ultimately store by store approach of how they can be confident that they can actually hit that science-based target um, and know the investments they have to make and know how much it's gonna cost them to actually get there. David B, do you have any um, really great success stories too from your end? Um, not in terms of decarbonization, because I'm not like, we're so focused on the other side. Like what about reforestation side? Like thinking that way. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I kind of tease this at the end of my pitch um, that Pacham was focusing on um, supply. Um, we launched our first, um, so we call it Pachama Originals. We launched our first project origination um, last November. The first trees went into the ground. 
It's uh, it's a project that's funded by Mercado Libre, which is the big. They're basically they're the Amazon of South America, uh, major major uh, public company there. Um, they invested a few million dollars up front, and the project is called Corridors for Life. There are all of these islands of virgin rainforest that are completely surrounded by agricultural expansion. And you can see them on the map and they're completely isolated. And the real tragedy there is that you're talking about one of the most biodiverse regions of the entire world, but you basically are, if you're cutting animals off, insects, bird, you know, birds can fly, but like other land creatures from mating, um, you're basically dooming them to live out their life and, and the species. Um, and so this project is a reforestation project, but it's working with local farmers to engage and compensate them. And it's creating these corridors. They're, they're planting mixed native species um, to connect uh, all of these pockets of virgin rainforest. Um, one and two, create a buffer around them. They've shown that um, Tree plantations, reforestation, a lot of the projects on their own, if it's just like a, by themselves, don't have the same climate and, and overall biodiversity impact. But if you plant them next to old growth forest, it creates a buffer that really significantly helps improve the health of the old growth forest that it's kind of protecting from uh, the elements of the human elements. So uh, yeah, I think that's what we're most excited about. And we're taking that model now to work with companies, other large brands can't name any yet but that will be investing in their in their own new projects so a lot more to come there i love that and that kind of goes into insetting too which is kind of cool um and i'll pass it over to um professor pack right um i just have a one quick question to each of our panelists i, I will start with uh to david ross i saw one of your slides that saying 70% of the global greenhouse emissions uh, come from infrastructure. Do you know any particular country whose central or municipal government showcases the de development of an environment-friendly infrastructure that facilitate decarbonization? And I also like to question uh, to uh, David Bushner. You've been involved in many different deforest deforestation projects around the world. In your opinion, which part of the world, any particular country come to your mind has done a great job in making progress in reforestation efforts and why? Um, I'll, I'll start with your question on the 70% statistic. So I don't know if I have a great answer for you. Um, the, 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 there's two regions that would come to mind. One would be Europe. I think being a, a little bit ahead of the curve, at least compared to the US and a lot of Asia, mm -hmm. in terms of investing more in offshore wind in certain areas, um, a lot more solar. But you know, as we're seeing with with the um, the war in Ukraine, you know, they're they're still relying on natural gas, so they're they're not you know um, they, they don't have the perfect solution. I think not not at the the state level, but you know, there's some really cool building designs that I've seen going up in Asia that are kind of these sustainable buildings where you have water capture, water reclamation, you have tree growth on different levels and forests where you ultimately kind of create this, um, this almost self-sustaining building mm -hmm. um, that kind of can, you know, has solar, um, so solar panels embedded so I think there's some really cool architectural work that's going on, but from a from a, a central government perspective, uh, I'm not aware of of anyone that's kind of put out a mandate of like starting today. You know, if, if we look at the state of California, um, California is fairly progressive. Just look at the, the the requirement for for motor vehicles, right? So passenger vehicles, I think, have to be zero emission after 2035, I think it is. Um, so I, we're starting to see more policies and regulations coming out like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think a lot of, a lot of governments are still trying to figure it out. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to rack my brain. What countries I, I think are doing a particularly good job? It's it's really hard to answer that question because there's so much. Like you know, we're we're working with certified forest carbon projects, but like there's so much good with your left hand and bad with your right hand. Um, as I mentioned, with like the oh, yeah. U.S. and signing the Trillion Trees Initiative. Uh, Europe, which does a lot of, again, is way more progressive and does a lot of good work, and they're starting to get flack on this. They were sourcing uh, carbon neutral energy where they were sourcing uh, from wood pellet biomass chips, and they are sourcing these from uh, forests in the Southeast United States and demolishing old growth forests there, replanting trees under the premise that, oh, the, we're replanting trees, so it'll be net zero after carbon neutral energy after 20 years. But if you're comparing an old growth eco forest, that's an ecosystem. A tree plantation is a thousand individual trees. Um, Brazil was starting to do a much better job. Unfortunately, in 2019, when Bolsonaro took over, we've seen it go right back to um, all progress has been lost. Their deforestation rates have, have skyrocketed. There's some hope at the uh, last, um, oh my God, what was the meeting in Glasgow? Um, COP, in the last COP in Glasgow, um, a bunch of countries, including Brazil and Russia, pledged to stop deforestation by 2030. I'll believe that when I see it, and also 2030 is too freaking late. Um, one country that I have, I can't, don't hold me to this, but I, I've, in the past I've heard, I think Costa Rica has been one of the like prime examples of, I mean, they're like the only country, one of the only major countries are countries in the world that doesn't have a military. Um, they, I know that they've conserved something like 70% of their country they've set aside as natural reserves. So uh, if I had to choose one country based on what I've seen, I would say Costa Rica is probably up there. Um, but all the other countries, it's really, again, it's really hard because they're, they're, they're doing such good work in some areas and the it's business as usual in so many other areas. Well, thank you so very much, David. And David, I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to be with you this afternoon. Um, you know, I'm struck by a number of things. Um, one is the, the profound need, <laughs> and you've both shared very important initiatives um, related to decarbonization. Uh, David Ross, you spoke about the journey to decarbonization and really helping organizations map that out. Uh, David B., you really spoke about really the profound need both uh, related to decarbonization initiatives, but really nature protection and nature restoration and, and really the passion for, for supporting and strengthening ecosystems, so, so very important. And, um, and then at the same time, we end understanding that um, we got a lot of work to do and like you said, there's both progress and backsliding, if you will, at the same time. Uh, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. But the reality is uh, that um, the need for collective action and really collective vision around these things is so critical. Um, then uh, the other thing, David, that you pointed out is really the technical work of both business scenario planning and basically the business case, along with the use of technologies of establishing baselines so that then targets can be responsibly set and moved toward uh, based on those critical baseline measurements. And the example of using satellite technology to really efficiently map uh, you know, what's happening in the forest and deforestation, as you were talking about, um, David Ross, the work of helping organizations like the uh, pharmacy, you know, the health system pharmacies and really understanding where their uh, emission is currently taking place and therefore how to develop multiple strategies, basically uh, based on both their, the, the way in which they, uh, they, they run their operations and also within the grids within which they operate. I mean, this question of operationalizing measurement and then goals and objectives based on that measurement is another key thing that you both identified. Um, I would just invite you maybe to wrap up as do you have any kind of closing 
kind of insight or statement or kind of anything that you would like to leave our students and our participants with before we, we sign off? Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but just wanted to give you the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would kind of end with is just a reiteration of, of a comment I made earlier is you don't, you don't have to come out of, out of school, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, and only go into a sustainability role. You know, you can impact climate change, take on sustainability, you know, touch on ESG from ton, tons of different positions within an organization. So just kind of be open to, to different opportunities as they come up. And if sustainability climate is your passion, try and figure out how you can integrate that into whatever role you end up in. Yeah, well, well said, and I'll, I'll piggyback on that. I think one of the reasons that I was excited to do this, I mean, of course, I'm friends with Mara and uh, wanted to help her out. Um, but is, is the chance to talk to more students. I mentioned very quickly earlier that I was uh, had a 10 year career in ad tech um, and I pivoted to this space about th exactly three years ago. Um, we need more smart, young, ambitious folks putting their time, energy and attention um, into sustainability, not less. And so, um, I kind of joked with my parents, my dad's a doctor and always knew he wanted to be that and loves what he does. Um, and I kind of joked with him when I was, I started at Pachama three years ago and I was uh, 34. I said, finally figured out what I want to do when I grow up. Um, it's been so rewarding and so fulfilling to work in this space and have purpose to what I do um, every day. So uh, I can't encourage uh, you all out there to pursue a field in this space more strongly um, what I will also tell you is like, um, you know, speaking at LMU, formal education is wonderful. I went to Emory. I have a law degree. Um, I, I'm, I'm all for formal education, but what I'll also tell you is, um, in like self-education is, is very underrated. If there are topics that interest you, uh, I love force. I read books about forests for fun and can cite tree stats and random things, but particularly Redwood. So, um, if there's, there's so many, as I said, there's so many climate solutions. Offsets are not the solution, they're a solution. So if there's a rabbit hole or an area that interests you, go down it, go reach out to folks like David or myself, right? Go learn about what they do. Go teach yourself about that topic on its own and, and go figure out, you know, I figured out how to get a job in force. You can figure out, you can figure out other ways right? Mara works for a clothing brand and is, you know, we're each having our impact in different ways. None is greater than the other. We need impact at all levels. So, um, yeah, that's, that would be my final messages. Uh, you know, continue, continue down this path. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Peck. Oh, thank you, Jeff, for summarizing uh, key takeaways from the panel discussion. Um, thank you so much for our panelists. David and moderators in leading uh, such a stimulating and intriguing panel discussion. Uh, if we have undergraduate students in the audience, I'd like to you know, mention about our course, Global Sustainability, uh, with a focus on East Asia, which incorporates and includes a field trip to South Korea and Japan. As David Ross mentioned earlier, actually that students will have an opportunity to see this with the advanced uh, the buildings that uh, which is designed to save energy. So, and actually that, that this will be a uh, real, you know, learning experience on how the either Japan and South Korea, uh, they advance um, in terms of decarbonization and saving energies and et cetera. So hope that you know we'll be able to resume this class next spring. Um, finally, of course, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today, and I hope that you have enjoyed the program. Um, we will host another webinar, the LMU side, as a pre-kickoff World Trade Month in May, with the topic in international career pathways on Tuesday, April 26th, between 5 and 6 p.m. This webinar will launch 
the new Global Trade Career Guide, highlighting international career path, pathways in public and private sectors. Global business professionals will share their career journeys uh, while providing practical tips and resources such as internships, scholarships, and jobs. I hope that I'll be able to see you again at the next webinar. As you leave, I really appreciate it if you can complete a brief survey at the end of this conference. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.